One of the uh, elements I've learned uh, latterly is that every archetypal hero's journey has what I suppose could be termed an initiation where there's a break between the awareness of life as it was and perhaps some kind of foresight into life as it may become. At that time, I was part of the faculty, a group of senior officers uh, from different forces in the United States who came together to work for a week with other senior officers who were vying for promotion. I arrived at the base about six or seven miles from the center of Washington, almost at midnight, and the bar was about to close. However, the barman was good enough to offer me a whiskey. And as I had this lovely malt, only one other person at the bar came up to me. It was pretty obvious by his accent that he was Scottish. And so I opened a conversation with him by saying, I love Scotland. <clears throat> and he, of course, responded and being the very congenial Andy Lothian, we engaged in a conversation. And we discovered that both of us were there for the same purpose. That is, the course that was being conducted on the Walter Reed campus. In the course of the conversation, it became known to Andy that I play the pipes. And I think that solidified the relationship um, and we talked of things, Scotland, and we talked of other things, and we finished our, our whiskeys and bid each other good night. That was how we met. So the next day, I discovered that Casey was one of the delegates in my class. The course had already begun, and we were all in session, and we got an announcement that something had happened. The initial stories were confused, and we were told only that an airplane had flown into one of the Twin Towers, Trade Center Towers. Um, and in the initial confusion, it was unclear if it was a small private airplane that had simply gone off course or been blown off course or something else. But of course, we retired from the course at that moment and tried to find a news outlet. We did find a television, and of course, the news was all over the television. Um, and by the time we did get to a news source, a second airplane had struck the other tower. And it was clear that it was not an accidental incident. So we stayed at the news outlet and not much later a third plane struck not so far from us hitting the Pentagon and Walter Reed campus is a matter of miles from the Pentagon so near to where we were at that point uh, those of us that could potentially help all went to the hospital to offer our services. And Andy and I met later that day, at which point I was rather dubious about the appropriateness of opening a session with the pipes given the events that had transpired. But Andy was not at all dubious and was very convinced that it would be a good thing to do and he persuaded me to open the session the next day with the pipes. The next day, the cohort of colonels and generals, of which uh, Casey was one, arrived at the classroom and I asked the group to stand, which they did, and announced Colonel Casey Jones. The rear of the training room opened and Casey came in. 
and with his bagpipes and you played Amazing Grace and the healing was instant in that room and these officers in particular many of them surgeons, surgeon commanders who've given the life not just to the military or any of the services but also given their lives to save lives and to heal and that moment of healing for them was it was immense within 10 seconds of hearing the first strains of amazing grace they were weeping holding one another and for three and a half minutes Casey played amazing grace I've never heard it played as beautifully before and I never will ever hear it played as beautifully again Some things occur to me. Uh, the first is that playing Amazing Grace on the bagpipes has become iconic of memorialize, memorializing the victims of 911. But it further occurs to me that that might very well have been the first time in a setting before a group that Amazing Grace had been played on the pipes to commemorate those fallen. And the healing began. I was a stranger in a foreign country that was under attack. And I felt something very important personally was going to happen. There is a natural law that suggests that for every adversity in life, at that moment of adversity, there is an opportunity which will deliver as great compensation as the loss. And I felt that through this violence, this collective violence in consciousness, that in my personal unconscious, I would be given something to compensate me personally for the violence that I had experienced. And I sat beside a fountain. It was a beautiful day. And I reflected on some of the elements of Jung's work that up to this point had escaped my cognitive ability to decipher their significance. And gradually as I sat there, as the sun began to rise to its zenith and slowly begin to set, there came to me all sorts of thoughts and ideas about the work that I had been studying for the last five or six years around Jung's attitudinal functions and the concept of the order and priority of eight attitudinal functions in us the combination of which gives each of us our unique personality. And as I sat there and began to scribble down some of the thoughts, formula came to me as to how these functions might interact and actually help us develop a deeper discovery, a deeper form of topology, very true to Jung, and one which, if I could understand it and bring it to consciousness, then others may also be able to work with it and take it even more deeply than I could. Up to that point, as I sat by the fountain, I suppose that discovery had become quite a functional system for me. It was touching people's lives, and the entry was through the colors, red, yellow, green, and blue. And as I reflected on the violence of what was in the extroverted world, and yet the personal compensation that I was experiencing as an individual 
through my introversion. I was drawn to almost all of the things in between. The dominant function, the violence, the inferior function, the shadow. Both real, both working with each other, both connected to each other and yet completely separate. And I suppose it was that connection and that moment in time that gave me the strength to think, how about the links between the dominant function and the inferior? There are another six functions between that, all of which are involved in this process. To this day, I can't tell you what emerged from that, but what I do know is it became the start of what is now Deeper Discovery. Deeper Discovery takes the work of topology, which is a conscious awareness or understanding of ego, who I believe I am, and personality, and my behaviors that result from that, to a much deeper level. Jung identifies the self two ways. Self with a small s. He talks as being our awareness in consciousness. It's the me I believe I am. Jung also talks about the self with a capital S as being the other half of the psyche. The half that resides in the unconscious, without which, Jung believes, we would not be alive. There is a direct link, a spark, an oppositional energy between consciousness and the unconscious for Jung. So most topology teaches us how to perform using more appropriate behaviors. What conscious topology doesn't teach us is how these behaviors in many cases come from the unconscious and are out with our control. An example will be when we get mad. We know that we have been in the grip of the unconscious, that deeper half of ourselves, when we behave in such a way that after which our reaction is, oh my goodness, I wish I hadn't done that. So deeper discovery is a route to understanding that part of ourselves which is generally hidden from us but is certainly visible to others. So all these years ago, my desire was to bring about a system where individuals could enter enter the area of self-understanding through the simplicity of knowing their top two types, who they were. But to really know my potential, I need to know all eight pieces of me. That's a simplistic overview, but at least in knowing all eight pieces of me, I'm bringing to light the six hidden parts of me that topology then hid from us.